everyone, and thank you for joining us for our live MDA Engage Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Symposium today. I am Nicole Petrowski, and I am MDA's Community Education Specialist. We appreciate you joining us, and we're glad to be able to share this important educational seminar with you. I also want to thank our supporter for this symposium, Sarepta Therapeutics, and their support is greatly appreciated. And we are committed to education here and believe in the power of bringing our community together for opportunities to learn from specialists and having opportunities to connect with others. This event is part of a larger MDA Engage series with disease specific symposia, which we are hosting today, community education seminars and community webinars. And here is the schedule of our upcoming community education seminars we will be hosting for the remainder of the year. These are day long educational seminars that provide individuals and families with knowledge and resources around neuromuscular care, information is shared by experts in the field on a variety of topics related to care, research, resources, et cetera. And these are some of our community webinars we have lined up going into the fall. Families can learn about different topic areas, and these are typically only an hour long. Each webinar features experts in the field, and then um, guests have opportunity to ask questions of the presenters. And here is our agenda for today. I do have a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin our seminar. Just so everyone knows, we are recording today's event and we will be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing in a few weeks. All of you who are joining, please know that all phone lines have been muted and we will be having a Q&A session at the end of each presentation. So please utilize the Q&A icon to type in your questions if you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of icons will appear. Just click on the Q&A icon and um, just send that to host. And you don't need to wait until the presentation is done to send your questions. You can also feel free to use the chat feature during this seminar. If you have comments or, co or questions um, for other folks that might be on the line, you can use that chat feature. Just make sure you click on to all panelists and attendees when you type in your comment. That way the attendees can see what you're typing in there. And then you will notice on the agenda, there are a few small breaks between some speakers. Please feel free to stay connected during the live broadcast during those times, but just know this is the time that I will be checking audio for the next presenter, so you will hear us talking. And then finally, we will be sending out a brief survey afterwards, and we want to receive your feedback on what you heard today. We want to make sure what we're discussing is pertinent and relative, so your feedback helps with that. And we will be doing a drawing for two electronic um, e-gift cards from Amazon, two $20 gift cards for Amazon. So we will choose two people and send that out after the symposium. And now I would like to introduce our first presenter of the day, Dr. Michelle Kittle Kittleson. Excuse me, she is a Director of Education and Heart Failure and Transplantation, Director of Heart Failure Research, and Professor of Medicine at the Smith Heart Institute at Cedars-Sinai. She received her undergraduate degree from Harvard and medical degree from Yale. She completed residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Cardiology Fellowship at Johns Hopkins, where she received a PhD in clinical investigation. She is deputy editor of the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation on guideline writing committees for the American College of Cardiology and is the co-editor-in-chief for the ACC Heart Failure Self-Assessment Program. Her essays have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Annals of Internal Medicine, and JAMA Cardiology, and poems in JAMA and Annals of Internal Medicine. So, Dr. Kittleson, thank you for being here today. I will go ahead and let you present your presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, the first test of the day, I'm unmuted. That's check. check. And the second Will I share my screen appropriately? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I pass the second test. Okay. You can see my slides? Great. We can. You look, yep. Looks great. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today about limb girdle muscular dystrophy and how it affects the heart. So, you know, I know a lot about cardiology and not a lot about muscular dystrophy. So I'm going to start, of course, by making sure uh, I, we are all on the same page when I talk about the muscular dystrophy. So as much as to teach you as to remind myself. So the muscular dystrophies. So we all know an inherited group of progressive myopathic disorders. Inherited means they're based, uh, caused by genetic mutations. Myopathic, they cause weakness, disease of the muscles. 
And they, you now muscles can be skeletal. There's also cardiac muscle. So there's some overlap between muscular dystrophies that can also affect the heart. Now the types are subdivided by the groups of muscle involvement. As you can see here, the shaded areas demonstrate different types of muscular dystrophy. And this symposium, of course, is focusing on limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which prominent, uh, predominantly affects the shoulder muscles and the hip muscles. Presentation, of course, patients develop muscle weakness diagnosed in childhood or adulthood. And in some forms of muscular dystrophy, heart failure may actually be the first sign. There are certain forms of muscular dystrophy where heart disease is very common. The, dystrin of, uh, the uh, dystrophin ones like Becker and Duchenne, limb girdle less prom prominent, and the diagnosis of muscular dystrophy, elevation of CPK, which is a muscle enzyme, uh, MRI of the muscle imaging studies to look for muscle breakdown, genetic testing, which has now come to the forefront even more than muscle biopsy to make the diagnosis, but muscle biopsy may be used if genetic testing is not available or uninformative. So this is a figure from an American Heart Association scientific statement on muscular dystrophies in the heart. And it goes through the various types of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Now, what's interesting is this statement came out in 2017. And lo and behold, in 2018, uh, muscular dystrophies, some of them were recategorized. So actually, these two are no longer considered limb girdle muscular dystrophies. But of the ones left, you see that various gene products, different components of the muscle are impacted. The heritance, some are autosomal dominant AD, some are autosomal recessive AR, which gives the percentage that a child may inherit it from their parents. And regarding the cardiac features, in some cases, these uh, cardiac features are very prominent and some they are less so. And the two we think of most commonly with limb girdle muscular dystrophy are ones that uh, are impacted by the FKR protein and beta sarcoglycan. So when I, and so the take home points from this figure is different genes can be responsible and that heart involvement is more common in some forms than others. So what I'm gonna tell you about limb girdle muscular dystrophy and the heart comes mainly from this scientific statement from the American Heart Association on the management of cardiac involvement associated with neuromuscular disease. And really when it comes to patients diagnosed with neuromuscular disease, there can be a spectrum of cardiac involvement. Many people have no cardiac involvement at all throughout their lifetime. Some people may develop arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms, and there's three different types we think about. There's atrial arrhythmias, which come from the top chamber of the heart, where the heart beats too fast. There's ventricular arrhythmias, which come from the bottom chamber of the heart. Now, while atrial arrhythmias can cause uncomfortable palpitations, they're not necessarily very dangerous. Ventricular arrhythmias, on the other hand, which come from the bottom chamber of the heart, can be more dangerous, can cause loss of consciousness, cardiac arrest, and in rare cases, sudden cardiac death. And then there's heart block, where the heart beats too slowly. The good news is there are treatments for these arrhythmias, medications to slow down the heart if it's going too fast, as well as implantable devices like pacemakers and defibrillators, which can treat the heart if it's going too slow or uh, treat a dangerous ventricular arrhythmia and stop it. The other cardiac involvement can be a cardiomyopathy or heart failure, which is a weakness or abnormality of the heart muscle. And that can take one of two forms. There's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the walls of the heart are too thick. And then there's a dilated cardiomyopathy where the walls of the heart become weakened and the chamber of the heart becomes dilated and enlarged. So when it comes to how to approach cardiac involvement in limb girdle muscular dystrophy, 
The guidelines from the American Heart Association are very clear and recommend that all neurologists diagnosing and managing neuromuscular diseases should work to identify either a cardiologist with expertise in these conditions or at a minimum a collaborative electrophysiologist or heart failure specialist depending on the condition being evaluated. And that's exactly because an electrophysiologist will be an expert in the heart rhythms, the arrhythmias, and a heart failure specialist will be able to assist with management of the cardiomyopathy. I am a cardiomyopathy or heart failure specialist, and I generally see the patients from the Cedar sinai Neuromuscular Disease Clinic referred to me, and then will then refer patients on to an electrophysiologist if indicated. And that's generally how the collaboration works. So as I mentioned, there's a spectrum. Some patients will have no issues at all, and some people will down the line develop arrhythmias or cardiomyopathy. So when it comes to heart involvement, the key is surveillance. So the diagnosis of limb girdle muscular dystrophy will come from the neuromuscular specialist. And the next step is a cardiac examination, physical examination of the heart, followed by some testing. There's the electrocardiogram, a representative sample is shown in the figure on the left, where there's electrodes placed on the chest and the electrical tracings of the heart are measured. That's an ECG or electrocardiogram. There's also an echocardiogram, that's the picture on the right, and that's an ultrasound images of the heart that look at the heart muscle, the heart function, the heart structure, the heart valves, a very in-depth assessment of how the heart looks. I've also mentioned here ambulatory ECG monitoring. So what's that? Well, when you get the electrocardiogram or ECG as shown in the figure on the left, that's one snapshot in time, takes about 30 seconds. On the other hand, sometimes you want a longer snapshot of what's going on with the heart rhythms. And for that, there's a wearable device that patients can put on, sticks on the chest, can wear for up to two weeks to get a longer picture of what arrhythmias may be present. And two important points to keep in mind. There actually are no currently medications or interventions to impact the natural history or risk of cardiac involvement. So when I'm seeing patients referred to me by the neuromuscular disease clinic who have a potential risk for future development of heart disease, we'll do screening studies recognizing that there isn't a diet or exercise program or vitamin or prophylactic cardiac medications that we know of to date that can make a difference. The key is surveillance to identify a problem when it happens. And so if a patient goes through this testing, the ambulatory ECG monitoring is a plus minus. It depends sometimes on the mutations, or the risks of cardiac involvement with that mutation or the patient's symptoms. And if a person has normal cardiac examination, electrocardiogram, echocardiogram, testing is repeated generally every two years or so or sooner if symptoms uh, intervene, such as chest discomfort, shortness of breath, palpitations, or fainting. If there's abnormal testing, then the test would be repeated every year. Say a patient feels great, but you find some abnormality on an electrocardiogram or echocardiogram, you may repeat the testing more frequently. And finally, if a person has symptoms of heart failure, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, or arrhythmias like palpitations or fainting spells, then a cardiologist will have much more close follow-up and treatment dictated by the specific condition. So speaking of the specific condition, what do you do when heart failure happens? This is a really busy slide. It's almost like I've broken a cardinal rule of PowerPoint presentations showing you a figure this busy, but I'm showing it to you for a very specific reason. This comes from an expert consensus statement from the American College of Cardiology on how to treat heart failure. Not heart failure specifically associated with muscular dystrophy, but any form of heart failure, weakening of the heart muscle. And I show it to you to illustrate that in fact, the busyness of this slide is a good thing. There are so 
many medications that can help patients with heart failure. And I'll name some of the classes of medications for you because I'm going to discuss them in a future slide. So we've got the ARNI, the ARNI, angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor, the ACE inhibitor, ACEI, the angiotensin receptor blocker, the ARB. Then there's beta blockers, there's aldosterone antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, diuretics, hydralazine isosorbide dinitrate, ivabradine. There are so many medications out there that depending on a patient's clinical picture can help. So lots of medications to help patients with heart failure feel better and live longer. So although the best case scenario is never developing cardiac involvement from a limb girdle muscular dystrophy in a way that's completely out of our control for now in the current era. Future advances may change that. But even if heart failure develops, there are great medications that can help people feel better and live longer. And heart failure medications work. So when, as a heart failure doctor, there's nothing I love more than talking about the medications that save lives, the four pillars, the ones we love the most are shown here. The ARNI, the beta blocker, the MRA, and the SGLT2 inhibitor. And just to give you a sense of how amazing these medications are for people who have heart failure of all kinds, not specifically related to mus muscular dystrophy, but heart failure in general, let's take all comers with heart failure who have a two-year mortality of about 35%. You add an ARNI, a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist, an SGLT2 inhibitor, you add the four pillars of life-saving therapy and you can reduce the two-year mortality down to 9.5%. That's really extraordinary. So again, the take home here is no one wants heart failure, but if you can't control if that's going to happen, but if it does happen, there are amazing medications that make a difference. And there's actually a fascinating study that came out of a center in Canada looking at the impact of cardiologists caring for patients with muscular dystrophy. So this was 185 patients recruited from a muscular dystrophy clinic. They were seen by neurologists, pulmonologists, lung specialists, cardiologists, physical therapists, nutritionists. And for the cardiology piece, they underwent the electrocardiogram. A Holter monitor is another word for the ambulatory ECG monitor that patients can wear for up to 14 days. Cardiac imaging, like an echocardiogram. Biomarkers are some blood tests sometimes used to assess patients' cardiac status. After this, the people uh, in the clinic underwent education and counseling, optimization of medications, and use of device therapies like pacemakers and defibrillators for abnormal arrhythmias, and were followed up. So what did the physicians in this clinic find? Well, of these 185 patients that were recruited, they had dystrinopathies, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy, as well as fasciocapular humeral dystrophy. And of this spectrum, let's focus on the blue bars. Those are the patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy, which is our focus today. And about a third of them actually had a cardiomyopathy or an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart that showed an abnormal heart muscle function. About 12%, a fewer, a smaller proportion, actually had heart failure, so symptoms of shortness of breath or leg swelling. And as far as arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythms, 18% had arrhythmias. So this is in contrast to the dystrinopathies like Becker and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where a much larger proportion, that's the red bar, two-thirds have a cardiomyopathy. It was about one-third of patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So this is the setup. These were the patients. So how did they do? Well, if you have a cardiologist following the patient, what I'm showing here is the before and after. So the shaded uh, bars are before a cardiologist got involved in their care. The solid bars are after a cardiologist got involved in, the, in their care. And the figure on the left shows us the key medications we talked about, the ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, the beta blockers, the MRAs. And you can see a higher proportion of patients were taking these really great medications after seeing the cardiologist. 
the um, figure B there, MTD is the mean treatment dose, was also higher. And then at the bottom, panel C, we see defibrillators, ICDs, and pacemakers, which are implantable devices used for abnormal heart rhythms, also a greater proportion. So, okay, the panels on the left tell us more heart failure and medications and devices prescribed. But even more important than that, the authors of this study looked at, well, what happened to the heart function? LVEF is another name for ejection fraction, left ventricular ejection fraction, which is a squeezing power of the heart muscle, which is how strong the heart is. And in fact, better heart function you can see after three years of follow-up after being seen and treated by the cardiologist. The blue bar is the limb girdle muscular dystrophy group. And you can see their ejection fraction or squeezing power of the heart muscle went up with good medical therapy. And finally, the panel at the bottom right there shows us what about heart failure hospitalizations and patients who have a muscular dystrophy are shown in the red line. And you can see that over time, there were fewer and fewer hospitalizations. So I'd say ultimately that's the goal. You put people with muscular dystrophy and cardiac involvement on good medications, their heart function may improve and you may keep them out of the hospital. So really what this study focuses on is the power of multidisciplinary care. Medicine is becoming so specialized. Every doctor seems to focus on a different molecule. But in a way, that's a good thing because it takes a lot of specialization to have experience and comfort with so many advances. And as we all, as doctors live in our little silos of expertise, it's important to be able to work together as part of a team, the multidisciplinary approach. So we can say that from this study, that initiation of the neuromuscular disease clinic intervention with cardiac care, including the electrocardiogram, the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart, sometimes a cardiac MRI, another imaging test, biomarkers or blood tests, and then up titration of medications with increased use of devices like pacemakers or defibrillators if needed, leads to what we call reverse cardiac remodeling, which means improvement in heart muscle function and improved outcomes with less heart failure hospitalizations. But sometimes this doesn't work, right? Sometimes, despite one's best efforts, patients progress with worse heart failure and you need to think about heart transplantation. And I wanna tell you a bit about this study. So this comes from a research database of 40,000 patients who underwent heart transplantation. 81 of those patients had muscular dystrophy. And so, and I show you in the pie chart here, the proportion. So what's the take home message here? Heart transplantation generally is pretty common. A lot of patients undergo heart transplantation, but very rarely do patients with muscular dystrophy undergo heart transplantation. If they do, as shown in the pie chart here, the most common reason for heart transplantation would be Becker muscular dystrophy, followed by Duchenne. Limb girdle makes up a small piece of the pie, about 4%. But when we think about what are the characteristics of people with muscular dystrophy with heart failure requiring heart transplantation compared to all other heart transplant patients. We can say that muscular dystrophy patients are younger, average age 22 compared to 54. They're more likely to be adolescents at the time of transplantation, more than a quarter, as opposed to all transplant patients in general, much less likely to be adolescents. Patients with muscular dystrophy who undergo transplantation are less likely to be women since many muscular dystrophies are inherited in an X-linked fashion. So boys or men are more likely to get them. Kidney disease I put on here. Well, kidney disease is a really interesting marker. When the heart is doing poorly, often you, that is reflected in poor kidney function. And patients with muscular dystrophy who underwent transplant were less likely to have organ dysfunction, meaning they were generally healthier going into transplant than all comers, patients with all types of heart failure requiring heart transplantation. So take home messages, 
Muscular dystrophy is a very rare reason to undergo transplant, but those patients with muscular dystrophy who end up requiring transplant are generally younger, which means the rest of their bodies are generally healthier. And how do they do? Well, we can see here that survival was in fact better than in patients without muscular dystrophy. So the uh, five-year survival, 86%, 10-year survival, 75%. Contrast that with all patients with different forms of cardiomyopathy or heart failure needing heart transplant. Five-year survival, 75%, 10-year survival, 56%. So what is this really telling us? I think the first take home lesson here is of course, no one with a muscular dystrophy wants to get heart failure and no one with heart failure wants to need a transplant. But if one does need a transplant, patients with muscular dystrophy can actually do quite well. And I think it's important to highlight why these patients have done so well in this large national database. It's because selection is key you know, muscular dystrophy can affect a lot of different organs. We look to see the respiratory muscle function. Will there be a problem with the respiratory muscle such that after a major surgery like heart transplantation, it will be hard for the patient to come off the ventilator. We try to screen very carefully for that. Swallowing ability, sometimes swallow muscles are affected by muscular dystrophy. Will a person have a lot of swallowing difficulty leading to aspiration and lung infection? that's carefully screened for. The ability to exercise and rehabilitate after transplantation and the anticipated progression over time. Will this person undergoing transplant be able to derive good quality of life from the transplant despite the muscular dystrophy? So really, I talked before about the power of multidisciplinary care and it's no much more so important than in the big decision about heart transplant candidacy, where neuromuscular specialists, geneticists, physical therapists, pulmonologists, cardiologists all weigh in to come together to attempt to predict the future in that will a person who has developed heart failure from muscular dystrophy bad enough to consider transplant actually feel better and live longer with that intervention. So take home points. Limb girdle muscular dystrophy may have cardiac involvement. Surveillance for cardiac problems with electrocardiograms and echocardiograms is key. If heart failure develops, cardiologists can help to adjust medications to improve the quality of life and survival, and heart transplantation may be an option. And future research, which I think you're going to hear about in the next talk, very excited about that, may target specific mutations and allow for focused therapy. Well, that's everything I wanted to say to you about uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy in the heart. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kittleson. We did get a couple questions in. Um, this person said that they didn't see limb girdle 2L on the list that included heart risk issues with limb girdle. Can you tell if limb girdle 2L has a risk to the heart? You know, it's a great question. And I think what that suggests more than anything is our inability to fully understand the natural history of so many of the subtypes because okay. our understanding of the ability to diagnose them and follow them um, can, it changes over time. So I would say the fact that it's not generally associated, that heart involvement is not generally associated with that particular type is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I think we, this is such an ever evolving field that there's never a clear definitive yes or no. But I always rely on the expertise of my neuromuscular specialist colleagues to say, to give me the direction, how, is surveillance important? Is it not important? and how often. So I think that that's the best sense is it reflects our n incomplete understanding and the lack of clear delineation of, of, of risk. And just by seeing the questions come in, there are a lot of subtypes. Um, yes. What about limb girdle type 1A? Yeah, you know, I think I'll answer for every subtype. Okay. I'll make a blanket statement that um, our ability to subtype 
in some ways may outstrip our ability to fully understand the cardiac sequela and consequences. And the best way to figure out the right screening program for your type of limb girdle muscular dystrophy is to talk to your expert specialist. And, and I think the best question to ask them is, I've got this type, okay. I'm getting cardiac screening, are you happy with the frequency or I'm not getting cardiac screening? What's the rationale for not doing it? I, I rely so, I'm, I'm a big believer in if I don't know the right answer, I get to tell you who to ask for the, for the right answer. And that's the question I would ask the specialist. Okay. That's, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Um, this person said in the, in the beginning, you mentioned limb girdle is n no longer considered a muscular dystrophy. Is that correct? Oh, no. I, I, I'm so sorry. I wasn't clear about that. There's okay. two subtypes of limb girdle that in 2018 were reclassified. Um, one as Emery Dreyfus, it involves um, the uh, a lamin A and C, and there's a second one that's, uh, actually I can't, I can't even remember off the top of my head. Why is that important? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the classification scheme changes because the surveillance and interventions and treatment pattern may change, but no, limb girdle is absolutely a form. It's just that certain subtypes have been reclassified based on a 2018 consensus statement from my neuromuscular specialist colleagues. But I think still the, uh, the most important thing is if you have limb girdle or, or any form of muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. many of them have more chance of cardiac involvement than less. And it's really at the guidance of the, the neuromuscular specialist to say, this okay. is the appropriate screening uh, program for your condition, or if you develop symptoms, this is the likelihood that your symptoms are caused by a cardiac cause given your a clinical context. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Is there a specific LVEF percentage that is a critical threshold for being considered for heart transplant? So I'm going to answer that question in two ways. I'm going to, first, I'm going to say, is there a critical LVEF threshold that we care about and worry about? Is there a threshold that is a trigger for medications or device therapy? And is there one that's a threshold for transplants? So let me answer those okay. three parts. So that's, a, that's actually a really good question. I'm going to elaborate. So, you know, a normal ejection fraction or squeezing power of the heart muscle is 50, 55% or higher. When it falls to below 50% is then when we start to say there's likely some type of cardiac involvement. But there can be another form in certain types of muscular dystrophy where the walls of the heart become thicker and the ejection fraction remains normal. So that's why there's, and of course the neuromuscular specialists are all very attuned to which ones need the cardiac screening. So when I see the patient referred to me in that manner, I will look not just on the ejection fraction, but also on the thickness of the walls and there's other parameters to see how stiff the heart looks. But generally let's focus on the ejection fraction. So Okay, it falls to below 50%, 45%. Even if the patient doesn't have symptoms, that tells me that there's starting to be cardiac involvement from their muscular dystrophy. And there are very preliminary small studies to indicate that if you start the medical therapy I talked about, even when you fall a little bit just below 50, not even into the 35, 30, 20% range where mostly we think about heart failure medicines as cardiologists, but you just fall a little bit, you start the medicines then, you may help preserve function. So very preliminary studies in small groups, but I think that's a trigger to be aggressive with the heart failure medications preemptively. So that's the heart failure medication piece. What about the transplant piece? So it's interesting that the decision to proceed with heart transplantation is based not just on ejection fraction. It's based on the clinical context. And there's a lot of parameters we put in place to decide is someone truly sick enough to need a heart transplant? Because there's a spectrum. And there are some people who live with an ejection fraction of 35% and feel fine. Um, their muscular dystrophy isn't that bad. They have a little weakness here and there, but they can get around. They're not troubled by shortness of breath, but they're not troubled by leg swelling. They're not troubled by any heart failure symptoms. They're not admitted to the hospital for heart failure. They're not fainting because of significant ventricular arrhythmias. That's the kind of patient that is monitored. 
Now, co contrast that with another patient whose ejection fraction is also 35%, who can't get dressed in the morning without feeling really short of breath because there's a lot of lung congestion from heart failure, a lot of swelling in the legs, admitted to the hospital periodically needing intravenous medicines to help them pee out the excess congestion and fluid that comes from heart failure. So you can have a spectrum of presentations with a given ejection fraction. So it's really the context. So just because you saw the cardiologist, your ejection fraction has been 55, 55, 55. If I'm, oh wait, now it's 35. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world. There's a really a vast spectrum of presentations and impact of medications. Okay. All right. Um, what could be some of the first symptoms that may indicate new cardiac, cardiac involvement for any patient? Yeah, so generally as a, there's two, so there's two things you think about the heart failure symptoms and the arrhythmia symptoms. The arrhythmia symptoms are classically palpitations, feeling your heart racing, skipping, or pounding, or fainting spells. Those two things make us concerned there could be an arrhythmia going on, and the symptoms can be absolutely random, not triggered by anything, just out of the blue, you feel something that's worthwhile alerting your physician to do further investigation. The mm -hmm. heart failure symptoms are generally more exertional. So you may notice you used to be able to take a 15 minute walk or lift really light weights or do some kind of stationary bike or some form of exercise or activity. And it's harder to do. And it's not harder because your muscles feel weaker. It's harder because you're having trouble catching your breath or you're having swelling build up in your legs. While there's a wide range of causes of these things, one potential issue could be a cardiomyopathy, weakening of the heart muscle. So as a cardiologist, I'm always attuned to subtle changes in the exercise capacity or exertional tolerance. So if you're always able to do a certain amount and now you can do less, that's when it's time to figure out what could be going on here and do further investigation. Okay, that's a really good point. How useful is cardiac MRI in detecting early HF and limb girdle? Yeah, I love that question. The answer is no one knows. Okay. Um, you talk to an MRI expert and they'll tell you, I get an MRI on everyone. You talk to a heart failure, not imaging cardiologist, and the question will be, I don't know how that really changes anything. Meaning, mm -hmm. we don't know yet. Say your ejection fraction, the squeezing of the power of the heart muscle looks totally normal. And say that the muscle thickness is normal and the patient feels great. If I get an MRI that shows me a subtlety, do you need to start medications at that point? Will it preempt, pre prevent progression? I think no one knows the answer. So I, I tend not to do tests that I'm con not convinced will change management, may cause more worry and concern than actionable information. So I tend not to. I will do an MRI in the situation where there's a disconnect. Someone okay. feels quite poorly, but the echo looks okay, or the echo images are technically limited for whatever reason. I need more information. But just for that garden variety, you feel great, you look great, your echo looks great. I'm, I'm not sure, especially when you're getting echoes on a yearly basis in many of these conditions, mm -hmm. you're going to really have a close eye and attention to when there are abnormalities that surface. Okay. How does one find a cardiologist that specializes in muscular dystrophy? I have had, is it tarcadia and pulmonary embolism that are not associated with limb girdle 1A? I'm concerned my specialists need to do further investigation. Yeah. So, um... So the first place I would start is with the neuromuscular disease specialist, because often they have relationships and tie-ins with cardiologists. Okay. So that's the first place I would look. Okay. Say your neuromuscular specialist says, gosh, I, I'm not sure, or you've already seen that person, you want to see someone new. The next step I would go to would be a heart failure specialist, because okay. heart failure cardiologists generally um, have expertise in the muscular dystrophy associated cardiomyopathies. Um, and I would say between your neuromuscular disease specialist and the heart failure cardiologist, you're going to cover bases and find someone with the appropriate expertise. Okay. And I think lastly, does family cardiac risk, such as parents and grandparents that have heart, heart disease um, and have passed away from early heart attacks at like 50 years old, does that affect the cardiac risk or the prognosis of limb girdle with someone that has limb girdle? 
so, um, so I guess the question is, if you've had family members with limb girdle and heart disease, how does that affect your risk with limb girdle, muscular dystrophy, and heart disease? I, 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 I think there's two ways to a answer that okay. question. I'm gonna answer that one, then I'm gonna answer the second way I interpret okay. it. You know, I, I think it's hard to know in a sense of, you know, for many genetic conditions, two family members can have exactly the same mutation, but a very different presentations and evolution. So, so it's, I think this is, this is also a, um, uh, a field in evolution. As we understand more, we'll know more. My sense is that if you have a family member with limb girdle and cardiac involvement, they may be more, uh, a, your specialist may be more attuned to checking for problems than you, but it's still no guarantee that your fate, because there's an interaction between genes and environment that, that plays such a role in so many multifaceted ways. The second question I would interpret is what if you have a random history of heart disease in your family and you have limb girdle, like a heart attack that was completely unrelated, how does that affect yeah. you? The two should not coexist and act synergistically. I mean, you may develop two independent cardiac issues, but they would not, it's not like a non muscular dystrophy associated cardiac history would impact your muscular dystrophy associated cardiac history. Okay. All right. There's a lot going on there. <laughs> yes. Yes. A lot. Very complicated. <laughs> All right, Dr. Thank Kittleson. You. Thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate your time. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. What an engaged audience. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.